Hello and welcome to the Nazareth Nicaea podcast and vodcast, the program where we look at all things related to Jesus in early Christianity. Today, I have a great guest with us, also a friend and a uh, very, very clever scholar by the name of Matthew Bates, who is a PhD from Notre Dame. Uh, he's also the author of several books such as Gospel Allegiance, Salvation by Allegiance Alone, The Birth of the Trinity as well. And he's also the uh, co-host or one of the hosts of a very popular podcast called On Script, and he teaches at Quincy University in Illinois. Matt, it's great to talk to you. How goes how goes life in America and the great state of Illinois? Yeah, the, the great state of Illinois is a good place to be right now as uh, everything is flowering and in full bloom. We have lots of dogwood trees. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's a pretty part of the world, um, but it is prettiest in the fall and in the spring. So we're enjoying life. Okay, excellent. That's good news. I mean, I've I've spent some time in Illinois. I've been to like Chicago land. Yeah, yeah. Been up to Deerfield and everything. A post-industrial wasteland in Chicago. <laughs> it's no, there's some pretty parts of Chicago too, but it's also. I remember the first time I drove into Chicago. I was actually going to Notre Dame for PhD interviews, and uh, I remember driving out of there, and it was all these just pits and trains and power lines, and I was like, "Oh, God, help me! Where have I come?" Um, yeah. But there are some pretty parts of Chicago too. Yeah, I did. I did drive down to Indiana for a bit too. Uh, went looking for the town of Pawnee. Uh, after a few days, I kind of figured out that it was actually a fictitious town. It doesn't actually exist. Uh, but I still kept looking around for it just in hope. Uh, Pawnee is the, um, the fictional town uh, in the American TV show Parks and Recreation. So mm. that's where it comes from. Uh, I wanted to visit. I've been told Zionsville is very similar, uh, but the, there is no actual place called Pawnee, which did upset me a bit. But what does not upset me and what fills me with joy, great p pleasure and feelings of, dare I say, um, euphoria is being able to talk about Christology to you, Matt, because you've written a, a stuff like the hermeneutics of the Trinity in early Christianity. You've also written a few things here and there about, you know, what was the gospel of the early church, but you've also written about uh, Christology in particular. You wrote a great little article on Romans 1 verses 3 to 4 uh, for the Catholic Biblical Quarterly. And um, for those who don't know, Romans 1 verses 2 to 4 or 3 to 4 is one of the big disputed Christology texts in early Christianity. And I thought it'd be great to discuss that text with you. So I've got a few questions, Matt, and just you know, just to get your, your feeling or your own view or conviction on this uh, very important text. So uh, let's kick off with, um, do you think this text is Pauline or pre-Pauline? Yeah, well, it's, you know, um, if Paul uses it as Pauline, but I do think it had probably a pre-Pauline history uh, before Paul opted to use it. And there's there's a number of reasons um, that scholars point to. I mean, usually that's um, a slightly more complex thesis, right? Just to argue there's pre-Pauline material. It's simpler to say, well, why didn't Paul just compose it? Um, and yeah, the, the reasons that scholars have given um, down through the ages, some are sound and some not so much. But I think there are sound reasons. Um, first would be probably there is some uncharacteristic vocabulary in this um, very short text, um, like um, the horistentos um, participle that Paul uses. We only find it here. Um, the collocation of the phrase son of God in power, all that combined is also unusual. And um, maybe even most tellingly, um, Paul refers to um, the spirit of holiness, hmm. which um, may be a slightly more Hebraic way of referring to the Holy Spirit or something along those lines. So um, those, um, yeah, those are um, a kind of a, a number of, you know, um, unusual features of the text in a very short compass. But there's also a, a very tightly structured symmetry to the passage um, that would make it appropriate for kind of corporate or um, 
you know, some sort of a proto creedal usage. Um, and you can't see that very well in English, especially because a lot of the English translations mask it. Um, but what you actually find um, in Romans 1, 3 through 4 is you find in Greek a participle, uh, and then you find an ek clause, uh, which is a, a a preposition and then followed by kata clause which is another preposition then you find another participle and then you find the reverse of that the kata and then the ak so it it has a certain kind of symmetry in the in the greek text um other things people have pointed at some um maybe of small weight like there's participial phrases that had the clauses and then some early proto-creedal formulations or creedal formulations of the early church also, participle phrases were used to structure. So there's there's a number of reasons there um, why we might think that Paul is using some pre-Pauline material, much like he does in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5, where he says, hey, I, I received material and I passed it along to you. Um, I think we could imagine something similar happening with Romans 1, 3 through 4. You know, that's a pretty good case for why it's you know pre-Pauline, even if Paul's maybe amended or, or augmented it somewhere. I mean, we, we don't know for certain. But yeah, I think for those reasons, are pretty sound reasons for thinking this is a bit of carefully cut, crafted material, whether it, whether we call it creedal or hymnic, whatever it is, uh, it's certainly something that has been structured in unpauline language and has a clear poetic uh, feel to it. Uh, but this has also been the verse that people go to uh, when they argue that, well, in the beginning, early Christology was kind of adoptionistic. Jesus becomes the Son of God, um, either at his baptism or his re resurrection. And in terms of Jesus becoming the Son of God at his resurrection, uh, this is the verse they go to. I've, I've got my got my Logos app here open, and it talks about Jesus being designated, you know, the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of Holiness, by resurrection from the dead. Uh, and numerous scholars have, uh, I mean, from Raymond Brown, I think, to Bart Ehrman and many in between, have seen this as an instance of adoptionist Christology. Uh, what, what's what's your view of view on that, Matt? Is is this something? Is this some sort of window into the adoptionist Christology of the early church before it becomes incarnational? No, <laughs> it's not. Um, I, I don't think that's a historically plausible um, solution for a variety of reasons, um, some of which um, I think you have outlined very cogently in um, your own book, um, Jesus, the Eternal Son, is that the name of the book? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I think um, you show in that book, and uh, this is something that I'd already agreed with before you wrote the book, um, that we don't see that kind of adoptionist Christology until the end of the second century with Theodotus. Um, and so um, maybe the even Ebionites around that time period. So yeah, it's, a, it's a later idea that emerges specifically um, in the wars over Gnosticism. And um, so we would have to make a case, like we would have to have clear evidence that um, we find adoptionist Christologies in the New Testament. And I just don't think we find clear evidence for them. So um, you have a, it's an uphill battle from the get go. If you wanna argue that there's an adoptionist Christology in this text. Um, but I think uh, as we read with care, we don't see an adoptionist Christology. And um, a couple of things that we would see in the texts um, would make that a difficult um, conclusion to come to, an adoptionist Christology. One is that whenever the, the passage opens here, when Paul puts himself forward as a servant of Jesus Christ, you know, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, right, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, right, he's already identified as the son of God mm -hmm. before we get into this text, right, um, and so right at the outset, right, this is the gospel that pertains to his son, and so then later on when we continue to read that he has been uh, designated is the, I guess was the, the language your translation you're reading from preferred uh, son of God in power, um, that was the the phrase that some people thought was adoptionist, right? Okay, well, he wasn't really God's son, but now he's been exalted or designated to this new role so that now he is um, the son of God and has been declared that in a powerful way, um, maybe one way of putting together the adoptionist Christology. Um, but that ignores the fact that he was already God's son, right? As that's yeah. uh, outlined earlier in the text. And it's also a weak reading of the text in terms of the Greek syntax. Um, it's much more likely that the, the phrase in Greek in power, the in phrase, 
um, doesn't actually modify the participle to horistentas there, but instead modifies the son of God in power, right? It's, um, it's modifying the noun phrase. Um, and that's likely because of, of the sequencing of, the, of the, the words in Greek on the one hand, uh, but also because uh, if we don't read it in that way, it disrupts the syntax. Right, we have a kind of tightly ordered syntax where we have this ek clause, this kata clause, this kata, and then and then it's followed by a kata clause and then an ek clause. The induname would then disrupt all that if we don't attach it to the noun. So for that reason also, I think we can we can um, see a structural reason in the text itself that that's a very unlikely construal. So no, I don't think this is adoptionist. Um, I think that instead we have a, an idea that Jesus was already the Son of God. Right, but now he's being. I, I wouldn't use the word designated. I would probably use the word appointed, or mm. um, in some way, um, it's connected. The horistentos is connected to boundary language, so that he's being um, uh, established, right, as um, the Son of God in power. And this, I would understand him being exalted to the right hand, right, that mm. he is being. Um, before he was the son of God, now he's the son of God because he's the son of God ruling at the right hand. So he has a new office. I would see it. That's another way of putting together the evidence would just be see this as connected to his exaltation to the office where he now rules as the son of God uh, in power in a new way. Yeah, I think that's definitely right. I mean, it, the whole thing is pre premised that Jesus is already the son. There's now a kind of new revelation or a transposition of how that sonship functions um, as the risen and exalted Lord. So, I mean, I tend to see the, I mean, you can tell me what you think. I think the emphasis here is not on him becoming something uh, he was not before, like um, attaining sonship, which he did not have. He's already got that, you know, the gospel of his son. He's the son of David. Uh, I think it's more about um, how he executes that sonship in a new eschatological role as God the Father's vice regent. So I, I tend to think it's it's regency, uh, not sonship, that is the new function that's being expressed. I mean, would, would that accord with your own with your own understanding, it, Matt? It does very much, but I, I would maybe nuance it slightly differently, but it's complementary to what you say. I'm I, what I would see being emphasized here is that Jesus's incarnation is in, is something that's in view, so that like he comes into being by means of the seed of David. But this coming into being is not in every sense. It's only Paul qualifies that and says it's according to the flesh, right? It's katasarka in the text, right? So that he then has taken on humanity. And so that's really the shift is that he's, he pre-exists as God, the son, as, as a part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? And he's already been ruling the cosmos in that capacity, right? But then the resurrection triggers his exaltation. Like, so after he takes on human flesh in the incarnation, <clears throat> then he's raised. Um, from the dead and appointed uh, or it, it appointed to the office of being son of God in power. So what's the difference? Like, how is his rule different? The rule is different because he's now become human, right? And so the, the taking on of his humanity is actually critical for our salvation, as I'm sure you would well agree, hmm. um, as then he's, but his exaltation then to the right hand of God, we would understand that to be a bodily exaltation. So he's now ruling at the right hand of God as an embodied human. And that's critical for the logic of salvation. And for, I think, even the logic of Romans, uh, mm -hmm. that he's now been exalted to the right hand of God in such a way that uh, we can see him and we can now see God's glory and he can rule as a glorified human over all creation. So I think that complements what you said, but is a slightly just different way of, of yeah, putting together our theo theology. Oh, that's right. That sounds like a, a great way of you know, adding to it how he's, you know, the son who becomes human. So, I mean, that, that would imp imply that there's an incarnational shade to it as well, not just the, you know, earthly to heavenly Jesus. There is a kind of becoming, I mean, which it's, which, I mean, that's, that's the word that's actually used. Um, yeah, the get you know, um, yeah. You know, uh, uh, ge uh, genomenos uh, is being used to say he one who, you know, shifts one from one state to another, as it were, you know, he becomes the seed of David. Um, yeah. what do you, what do you think this, this little, I mean, assuming this passage is pre Pauline, it's something that comes maybe from the, um, Greek speaking wing of the church or maybe earlier, maybe it's based on something in Aramaic. I mean, people have experimented with all sorts of retroversions into Aramaic. Um, what, what do you think this tells us in terms of the, 
of the early church of you know of their view of jesus or their just view of of god and the story of salvation i mean is there anything we can glean what this tells us about the early church and and, and what they're interested in and what they're up to yeah i i think that um if we were to kind of yeah to to grab out a couple theological themes um in this text um i think one thing that's emphasized is that this is a continuation of what god has already been doing like we he uses the language of promised in advance right um the um and in speaking about the gospel um that that pertains to the son right that this was all promised in advance in the scripture so i think that we would on the one hand want to say that the early church was interested in that continuity right and seeing this as a fulfillment of something god has been faithful to and has been doing for a long long time um and so um i would see that as something that's emphasized um then when we move into the proto creed proper i would say that part maybe is more emphasized by paul right as paul's framing but then when we move into the proto creed proper or whatever we're going to call it um, with Romans 1, 3, I think that the, the first emphasis, um, really, you can kind of, like, in terms of the structure, you can see what is what what, what was emphasized in the protocreed are certainly the two participles, right, just because structurally those are are set forward, I guess, would be a, a one way of thinking about it, right, where we have the two genomenu, um that we just mentioned, right, um, that I would prefer to translate as came into being, mm-hmm. um, and that sounds, on the one hand, like, heretical, because you're saying, like, well, he wasn't, like, he didn't have being, and now he came into being but no again not not so much because it's qualified only as this pertains to his flesh right did he come into being um and so and i would see this as by means of of the seed of david as a reference to mary it's very similar to the passage in galatians for um galatians 4 um, 4 4 through 5 where, where paul um speaks about um 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 the son coming um coming into being um Born of, woman, of a woman, born under law. Yeah, born of a woman, uh, born under law. And it's, it's the genomai verb there um, for the the born of is actually, it doesn't say born of in Greek, right? It says came into being, right? It's the, it's the genomai verb. Um, so this would be a very, very similar text to that. Uh, so I would see it emphasizing the incarnation, right? Um, and then then the second um, text, the two horistentos text, uh, emphasizes his exaltation to the role of son of God in power. Right, so that he's um, raised um, from the midst of the dead ones. So it's not about a one-off miracle. It's not about um, how, you know, like, isn't that neat that God can raise Jesus as this one-off person in history, or right? it's more emphasizes that Jesus was in the abode of the dead. Uh, this would connect to the early, you know, Apostles' Creed, right, where it talks about Jesus descending into Hades, right, um, and the, the idea that he was where all the dead people are. Right. But then God raised him up. And so we could see this as connected to the plundering of Hades motif. Right. Where if God raised him up from the dead, he'll raise all of us up, too. Um, and that's all I think um, we can see that kind of latent in the proto creed um, there. Um, all of those um, ideas. So it has a very, very rich theology. Um, and then Paul doubles down on all this, says this mm-hmm. is about Jesus, the Christ, our Lord. Right. That very um, strong language of him being the king and the Lord, the one who rules. And all of that is put forward as part of the gospel. And then we're invited to respond to that, right, through the obedience of faith or what I would call loyal obedience or allegiant obedience. Uh, so all these things are part of, um, I think, uh, this early important expression of the gospel. Yeah, I like what you um, say there about the emphasis on resurrection from the dead. Uh, in most translations, they say, um, you know, uh, who was uh, brought back to life or he was raised from I, or no, most, most translations talk about his resurrection from the dead, whereas that that pronoun his is not actually in the Greek text. Yeah. Um, but and it gives you a kind of what well, I think they call a generalizing plural from the resurrection of dead ones, which means it's put in the context of the general resurrection. So the, yes. the general resurrection that was meant to be either all Israel or all the righteous at the end of the age. Instead, that's happened to one man. And that's the kind of prototype um, of, of what's going to happen later. And that's why Paul can say, oh, yeah, Paul can say in Romans 8, uh, just as God raised his son from the dead by the Holy Spirit, so too he will give life to your mortal bodies. So that's, the, I think, the foreshadowing of the, the, the future resurrection based on what happens uh, proleptically uh, in Jesus. Um, final question for you, Matt. Um, well, what, do, what then does this tell us about 
Paul's own distinct Christology, uh, because you know Paul's Paul Paul is his own. I mean, he's different to say the Gospel of John. He's got his own vocabulary, his own suite of favorite texts that he likes to draw on from the Old Testament to explain who Jesus is. He's not the same as Hebrews. He's not the same as the Book of Revelation. How do you see this passage fitting into Pauline Christology? Yeah, that's probably the hardest question um, that you've asked, as uh, yeah, I do have to think hard about that. Uh, one thing I would certainly say is that it um, Paul's, you know, a very important Christological category for Paul is that he is the son, right? And we don't need to go trotting off to find less plausible solutions like Bart Ehrman does, right? Where, where he wants to say, like, on the basis of some obscure text in Galatians, that's probably like in the, the Galatians text is superlative, right? It says something along the lines of, you know, that um, when you helped me, it was as if you were an angel of God, as if you were Christ Jesus himself, mm. right? As, and uh, it's probably like upping the ante, right? Like, well, what's mm. better than an angel? Well, Jesus is better, right? But Ehrman takes that as a reference to say, like, well, they must have thought of Jesus as some sort of angel. Um, it's like running to find a, you know, a drink of water a hundred miles away when you've got a a glass, uh, you got a spigot in your sink, right? And you can just yeah, get a it's, drink it's, there. It's a very, it's yeah. a very, it's a very thin leaf um, that's supporting a very heavy branch. Absolutely. Um, it's a, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, the ubiquitous category in Paul, um, you know, for thinking about pre-existence, for instance, would be mm. the idea of the sun, right? We would find um, numerous texts in that direction. Uh, but beyond that, um, also um, places where Paul um, understands the pre-existent um, son to be speaker of the Old Testament, like passages like Romans 15, 3, right, where he um, w wants to say that the Christ was the one who spoke certain Old Testament psalms. So, um, yeah, as we think about the distinctive Christology of Paul, I do think that um, probably incarnation gets underplayed a little bit um, in Paul. Um, and this would be an important passage, I think, that would help us to see that that Paul, even though he's not using language of incarnation, we don't find language of enfleshment here. Um, mm -hmm. It's clearly um, moving in those directions, so that you know, whenever we have the Gospel of John saying the Word, you know, took on flesh and made pitched his tent in our midst, and all of that, um, we wouldn't. I wouldn't see that as being so distinctively Johannine. Maybe um, taking the word right or the logos and seeing that as preexistent. Um, maybe that's a little more distinctively Johannine than um, Pauline. But the idea of incarnation, I would see as as also uh, very much present in Paul. You know, Hebrews has a more developed idea, obviously, of Jesus as the high priest. Um, we see we see that maybe intimated in Romans eight eight thirty is it eight thirty four right where it talks about him being at the right hand, <laughs> um, you know, and it suggests him him mediating our prayers as part of that right um, yeah, interceding. Uh, yeah, yeah, that he's interceding on our behalf at the right hand. This is a priestly vocation seems to be suggested, but Paul um, Paul puts more emphasis. I, I think it's fair to say on Jesus as the Christ. Uh, and in the in the royal sense, not in the priestly sense, right? I and mean, we see that. I mean, we do see him as the priest, but it's it's um, yeah. I think that we would see that's a little bit more characteristic of Hebrews Christology. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'm curious to you have anything you want to add? Um, I, I, as I'm just yeah. curious to hear your thoughts on that. I think it's definitely underscoring the messianic identity of Jesus. Okay, so in what sense is he the Messiah? Well, he's he's you know from the seed of David, but he's also exercising something beyond any Davidite by being you know enthroned at, at Yahweh's right hand, and he's you know the the one in whom uh, God acts in his salvation and in his judgment. So I think it's kind of specifying the nature of the of the in which Jesus is the messianic son. So I think it, it contributes. Prim primarily to that, uh, and with a sense of both, and probably I think it's got some it intimates incarnation, but it also talking about the, the the function of the exalted Jesus as a kind of being the Father's vice regent. I mean, that's what I would take the the the, the main the main way it sort of marries up with um, other themes and key texts and Pauline Christology. Uh, oh, but Matt, helpful. since I since I do have you here, and I think we do have time, I know a theme near and dear to your heart is the idea of gospel allegiance. I mean, you've written a couple of books on this: salvation by allegiance alone, uh, also gospel allegiance. Uh, now, I think this is good because people think of salvation by faith, but faith 
does include faithfulness. I mean, the same Greek word can connote either faith or faithfulness, uh, and 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 that they're both kind of implied. You could you could argue, and uh, someone who's near and dear to my institution's heart, Leon Morris, famous mm-hmm. Australian biblical scholar. I did mm-hmm. I did come across a passage once where he was trying to explain the meaning of faith, and he did use the word allegiance to describe it. And uh, I mean, although yeah, the I be- like Leon Morris, yeah, he was a great yeah. scholar. Yeah, he yeah. was. He was. Yeah. And um, you know, Paul. I mean, he gives this little sort of you know gospel t- uh, gospel tweet using pre Pauline material about you know the messianic son, you know, son of God in power. Um, he then talks about the grace of apostleship, uh, which is to bring all the Gentiles to the obedience of faith. And it's, mm-hmm. it's interesting, and this, I get students to write essays on this, because the letter also ends in 1626 yeah. with um, his purpose of his ministry is to bring Gentiles to the obedience of faith. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's endless monographs and articles. What does the obedience of faith mean? Is it the obedience which consists of faith? Is it faithful obedience? Um, what, what does this theme of faithful obedience to Jesus actually mean? mean and and why is the concept of allegiance a good way of understanding it yeah i think that we have um i think the concept of allegiance is helpful because um, we always need to think about frames right as we're trying to like unpack the yeah the semantics of any passage and so the royal frame is very prominent right in paul but we i think have been slow to pick up on the royal frame partly because um, there's been a tendency to just kind of gloss by the Jesus Christ, right? And just kind of like, what's his name, Jesus Christ, or to kind of create, to treat Christ as if it's an empty signifier. It's just another way of saying Jesus, right? Whenever we realize it's about, no, it's about a Davidic king, right? A, a, a long awaited king that would come and who would, would, would come through the line of David and who would, would rule over Israel, but through that would have a, a broader um, impact on the nations, right? It would, um, in that sense, be a universal rule. When we realize that the Christ means all that, right, it, it kind of um, cracks open a window into um, how all that language connects. Um, and so in the Greco-Roman world, like benefaction was very important, right? So um, whenever you had a powerful figure like a king, loyalty to that person was very important and that king's graces or benefits that that king would give uh, were also equally important. So some of this language that we so often use in Christian circles and often reduce down to kind of theological buzzwords that um, we just kind of trot out, um, but we don't even know what they mean anymore, words like faith and grace, the gospel, Christ, right? As we, as we kind of put them into historical context, Um, I think that we can see that there's something more important going on there. So if Jesus is the Christ and he's our Lord, as it says in this passage, right? And then we we trace out faith language. It seems like Paul wants to see faith language as something that's externalized, um, something that you can see somebody else doing, right? Um, And it's a very relational term, but it's relational with respect to Jesus as the king. Um, and so that, I think, helps us understand more about um, allegiance, right? That um, what does a king primarily demand? He demands of his people that they be loyal to him, that they be allegiant. Um, so I think it's helpful um, to use that language, partly because it, it taps into the, um, yeah, the, the royal framework. Okay, that's a good way of putting it. Well, I've been talking to Dr. Matt Bates of Quincy University about Romans 1, 3 to 4, early Christology and the obedience of faith. Matt, it has been a pleasure talking to you. Hey, thanks so much, Mike, for having me. I appreciate you. No worries, man. Well, all the best, and I'll catch you in the future. I hope you like that conversation with Matthew Bates. In the future, I'm going to continue looking at the pre-Pauline Christology materials. Maybe I'll kick off into Philippians 2, 5 to 11, or maybe Colossians 1, 15 to 20. I haven't decided next, but either way, the series will be continuing. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment, or you can even follow me um, at Twitter, at Ember12, or you can also find me on my Substack page, which is michaelfbird.substack.com. So yeah, see you around, and for the next episode of Nazareth to Nicaea.